सर होना पैसे और इस तो पुआने देखा पाया सो अपना सर सर मोर वॉइस तो आ ही से हम्म तुम आटो पैसो सोमा सर के बाटा प्रॉब्लम पाया से अच्छा सोमा सर इन्हें तो ऑन देखा ही से ना ऑन देखा ही से किंतु सारे मोर को नहीं आ से फोन कोई सिल किंतु सारों माने जो दिव माइक तो ऑन हुए आ से किंतु आहा नहीं था माने माइक माइक्रोफोन और इस ऊपर पर मोबाइल ऑनरेबल वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर नृपेन्द्र नारायण शर्मा सर एस्टीम स्पीकर दीपक कुमार प्रोफेसर दीपक कुमार मिश्रा सर चेयर एंड डिस्कशन इंद्रनील भौमिक सर डिरेक्टर्स अफ डिफरेन्ट स्कूल अफ आर यूनिवार्सिटी माई कलिग्स एंड डियर पार्टिशिपेन्ट्स आई डोला बरकटी ऑन बिहाफ अफ सूर्य कुमार भूया स्कूल अफ सोशल सैंसेस Krishnakanta Handik State Open University would like to extend my heartiest welcome to all of you to this webinar on vulnerable migrants in contemporary India towards an inclusive migration policy. It is our it's indeed our honor and privilege to have amongst us Professor Deepak Kumar Mishra sir from Jawaharlal Nehru University New Delhi to speak on such an important issue of concern we are also honored to have amongst us uh, professor Indranil Bhomik sir from Tripura University to chair the session we all indeed look forward to a very very enriching session with these words i would i welcome you all once again and i request our honorable vice chancellor sir uh, to kindly deliver the inaugural address sir please thank you <clears throat> thank you dola borkotoki uh, good evening to all of you uh, more specially uh, professor deepak kumar mishra and professor indranil bhomik first of all on behalf of kk hendik state of university each and every one in kk hendik state of university family i would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you we have two distinguished speakers 
in this webinar, Professor Deepak Kumar Mishra, who is a professor on Jawaharlal Nehru University. And the discussion will be shared by, and at the same time, uh, moderated by Professor Indranil Bhomik, who is from Tripura University. And they are here in our midst this evening to discuss and to take forward a special topic that is on vulnerable migrants in contemporary India. And the focus of this topic will be on leading the discussion towards an inclusive migration policy. The topic is of very contemporary interest, more especially in today's context in the COVID scenario. And when we talk about contemporary India, this COVID phenomenon is just about two years, but we cannot rule out the pre-COVID scenario also. And contemporary, and this is all right in terms of meeting the continuity of the developmental scenario. Uh, Indian economy, contemporary Indian society, Indian economy, uh, mostly characterized by growth in the service sector. And uh, the, there has been some structural changes in the economic structure, primary sector, uh, tertiary sector, and the secondary sector. Migration is inevitable. We have been talking about the migration from rural to urban. In certain cases, we have also been experiencing the reverse migration from urban to rural. And rural India is also a great process of transformation. The rural disposable income is increasing, purchasing power is increasing, and there have been lots of interrelationships amongst the various sectors of the economy. And in all these things, migration is a reality. And uh, despite migration being a reality, uh, we are having some kind of doubt in terms of the policy framework. And uh, rural to urban migration, more or less, we know about the phenomenon. But uh, migration caused by some unknown factors, uncertain factors, many times create confusion how to deal with the situation. So in those cases, when migration is a reality, and uh, we are also experiencing another facets, another aspect of this migration phenomenon, that is that migration more or less was traditionally known possibly in the low end sector, like the skilled workers from rural to urban. But in the COVID scenario, we have also seen the migration related issues happening in the uh, high end sectors, more especially in the IT services or the, or the IT, yes, IT enabled services sector. So all these things, uh, pose some kind of uh, inconsistencies, some kind of vulnerabilities amongst the migrant workers. So in order to address all these problems, all these issues, we need to have some kind of comprehensive uh, policy framework, which needs to be inclusive. And uh, today's discussion, two of the thought leaders are here in our midst they will definitely share their perspectives and possibly this will give us meaningful inputs towards developing a policy framework or uh, towards having discussions on the considerations to be made while developing an inclusive migration policy in today's contemporary India so that the vulnerability which is often experienced as far as the migration is concerned can be addressed and redressed. With these few words, I would like to extend our warm welcome to the distinguished speakers and to each and everyone in this webinar. And I wish the webinar all the success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for providing that introduction to the Unversed. May I now request Professor Joydeep Borua, Director Kujo Kumar Bhunia School of Social Sciences, to kindly introduce the guest speaker for today's lecture. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor in charge, uh, Sarma Sir. Speaker for this evening, Professor Deepak Kumar Mish, uh, Chairperson for the program, uh, Indranil Vomik, esteemed guest participants, colleagues, and student friends. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the 
online lecture series organized by uh, Surjo Kumar Vya School of Social Sciences, KKH State Open University. This is the sixth lecture in the series. And the idea of having these lectures is primarily to provide a platform to listen to and interact with distinguished academics on diverse themes of relevance, importance, and interest. The lectures are being hosted by uh, various disciplines of school. And this particular lecture is being hosted by a uh, discipline of sociology and social work jointly. Uh, I'm deeply grateful to Professor Deepak Kumar Mishra for accepting our invitation to speak to us this evening and also to Professor Indranil Bhomi for kindly agreeing to chair the program. Uh, let me take a couple of minutes to introduce our speaker and the chair today. Professor Ripok Mishra is currently teaching at the Center for Study of Regional Development, CSRD JNU. He also taught at Rajgan University Department of Economics for quite some time before joining JNU. Uh, he has been the CCR Chair Professor, International Center for South Asian Studies, Russian State University for Humanities. Uh, he was also Commonwealth Visiting Fellow, Department of International Development, Queen's Elizabeth House, University of Oxford, and also South Asian Visiting Fellow in Department of International Development, uh, Queen Elizabeth House, Oxford, once again, uh, during uh, 2007. His areas of interest and specialization includes political economy of agrarian change, economic transformation of mountain economies, a rural livelihood and agrarian institution, migration and human development. His uh, many publications include uh, books, uh, Unfolding Crisis in Assam's Tea Plantation and Employment and Occupational Mobility. Uh, then he also published uh, a book, uh, The Internal Migration in Contemporary India, and the Rethinking, also another book, Rethinking Economic Development in Northeast India. Uh, so I welcome on behalf of the school and the university, uh, Deepak. And uh, the Indranil Vomik, uh, let me introduce him and welcome. Uh, he is uh, teaching economics in the Tripura University. He is currently heads the Department of Economics there. His areas of interest include agricultural economics, plantation issues, economy of Northeast, public economics, issues related to migration and development. So uh, we are very happy and pleased to have uh, these two eminent scholars, academics amidst us to discuss which, a very important issue. And then we hope that we will have a very fruitful discussion today. Um, so without much further ado, let me invite uh, Indranil Bomik to take the chair, charge of the chair and uh, take this forward. Uh, before that, uh, may I request all the, uh, the participants to kindly mute their mics uh, because uh, if their mics are on, it will be uh, very disturbing. And uh, if you have any questions during the deliberation, please use the chat box to write it down. Uh, our colleagues will note down those uh, queries and comments and pass it on to the speaker to respond. So with, the, uh, with this uh, initial remarks, let me introduce, you know, invite Indranil Vomik to take the charge and take these things forward. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. My network is very slow. I am not sure whether you can hear me clearly, but it's a big pleasure for me. I humbly thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor of KK Hendik University, Professor Sharma, Professor Boruva, the main organizer and the chair director for the Surya Kanta. Uh, Surya Kumar Bhuva School of Social Sciences. The resource person, Professor Deepak Mishra, it's a pleasure that uh, I'm listening to you, all the participants and colleagues from KK Hindi University. The topic, as we all know, is extremely relevant and particularly from the point of Northeastern India, we are we do have various ways of looking into it. We are vulnerable. We have a large migrant population. We have a large number of in-migrants. We have a large number of out-migrants. And in contemporary India, we need to consider where do we stand? 
So without making any further delay, I would humbly request Professor Deepak Kumar Mishra to make his presentation. We can always get back to him after his presentation is over. Professor Mishra, the stage is all yours, please. Uh, thank you. Good evening, friends. I'm also grateful to uh, the Vice Chancellor. After his uh, presentation is over. Yeah. Uh, hmm, Professor Barua. Professor Mishra, Barua. Yours, yeah. please. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. You are. You are. You are. Good yes. evening, friends. Uh, it's a pleasure indeed to be part of this conversation. I'm grateful to the Vice Chancellor and Professor Barua and other organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, something which is in our minds ever since we have seen those images of uh, migrant workers desperately trying to get back to their homes. But let me begin with a caveat, uh, a few in fact. One is that I normally don't work on policy areas. I would, I would like to, uh, you know, describe myself as a field economist. So my understanding of migration processes are primarily uh, through my uh, field survey, primary field research based uh, understanding of the processes on the ground. But since uh, the vulnerability of migrant workers has been one of the you know, widely discussed topics, and there is always a question at the end of all kinds of discussions that I've been you know, part of as to what can be done. So I have ventured into, you know, this area of uh, at least looking at few ingredients of an inclusive migrant uh, migration policy for India. And I'm sure that your suggestions, your critiques and, and comments would help me uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to further develop some of these ideas. Uh, so let me start Scaring, sharing my screen first. And is my screen visible? Can you please? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, for all researchers who have been working on uh, migration and, and various aspects of it. Mm -hmm. The lack of adequate data to begin with and adequate understanding of the, the conditions of migrant workers was known to them than before the pandemic. It's a pandemic, a humanitarian crisis of such proportion, huge proportion, that finally brought migrant, migrant workers into the focus of policy circles. And it is a sad commentary on our understanding of uh, the, the vulnerabilities that sections of our working classes face on a day-to-day -day basis. In a sense, migrant workers made themselves very visible by reacting to the crisis. But their statistical and policy invisibility, in invisibility is clear from the fact that in the initial responses to the crisis, Migrant worker as a distinct category was not even taken into account. Only when we were confronted with those images of despair, that we started to uh, to, to 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 recognize, to uh, at least we started to uh, you know empathize with uh, the problems faced by migrant workers. Initially, however, they were treated as deviants, as a law and order prob problem. Uh, not only during the process of migration, reverse migration, but also uh, at the origins, they were stigmatized and isolated. So this treatment says something about the way migration and migrant workers remain invisible to, to our dominant, remain invisible to, in, in our dominant policy discourses for a long time. However, after that, after the initial phase, there were lots of efforts, both by the government and by the civil society, and of course by researchers, to understand this crisis, to understand various dimensions of this crisis. I'll just, I've just listed some of the, uh, you know, quick surveys, rapid assessment, and 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 other kinds of surveys. 
and the conclusions are not very surprising. We find that there was a catastrophic loss of earnings, employment because of the lockdown, decline in consumption expenditure of households, food security and, and hunger increased, health crisis, not only during uh, the, the first and second wave, but also the post-COVID debt burden caused by catastrophic health expenditure, uh, various kinds of violence. But two aspects of it, of, of this survey, I think I would like to emphasize upon. The first one is that even when the eligibility criteria were met, and even when the, the, there were some uh, assistance which were provided by the government, the reach left much to be desired. It was not enough. Secondly, at least one of the surveys point out that even within the category of migrant workers, vulnerable migrant workers, you find that people belonging to socially marginalized groups suffered more. Same is true of the recovery. There is a, I mean, there is a significant uh, you know, diverse, uh, significant diversity in terms of the, the way uh, uh, livelihoods have been recovered post uh, the uh, initial phases uh, of, of, of the crisis. Simply because we became aware of, at least more aware of the uh, conditions of vulnerability of migrant workers during a crisis, there is always a danger of assuming that it was primarily because of the nature of the crisis the, 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 the enormity of the crisis, the suddenness of the crisis, and hence our responses might be uh, short term or in response to a crisis situation. But there are long term questions as, 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 uh, as it, it, it is pointed out many a times, that unless we look at the structural reasons behind the crisis of survival, the long term reasons which caused such kind of a response, we probably will not be able to design or develop a kind of response which is required to address the problem. So I would like to focus more on the long-term uh, reasons and the, 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 the presentation that I'll share with you today is, is basically in two parts. One, in one part, I would, try to, I would like to share my understanding about uh, what are the reasons for which uh, such a vulnerable workforce uh, is there in India in the first place? And what are the conditions in which these uh, vulnerabilities are created, reproduced, and sustained over a period of time? So that's the first part. And the second part, can something be done about it in terms of policy? If we think of policy, so what are the options that we have? What are the at least basic ingredients of, of, of such a policy, which is inclusive in nature? The, the nature of economic growth that we had in India, and this is many of the many of us know about this, that, that the structural change that followed, first of all, it was it was slow. And when it started to take place in the in the past two decades or so, we see that uh, the, 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 the out-migration of labor from agriculture did not lead to an expansion of significant expansion of the workforce in manufacturing. It's not manufacturing which absorbed the force, the labor force which was displaced, but the labor which was displaced. But primarily, this labor was uh, engaged in, in the service sector, in particular in the urban informal sector. Even if we disregard the, the, the fluctuations in the, in, the, in the growth trajectory, by and large, even in periods of relatively robust growth, growth in per capita income, we see that employment expansion has been very slow. And it has been catastrophic in the past few years before the crisis, before the pandemic. So on the one hand, a tiny section of the service sector uh, workers are being able to access better paid, uh, highly uh, globally integrated uh, jobs. But on, for the majority, this transformation has meant a movement, a mobility from agriculture to largely the urban informal economy, which of course is highly diverse. Informal economy is characterized by lack of social security, but it is also uh, a, a sector which absorbs lots of uh, diverse forms of employment from self-employment uh, to 
to unpaid family workers, to wage workers, so on and so forth. All studies in, on, on migration flows in India point to the segmented flows. It's not only diverse, it is segmented. The migration flows are segmented. That means that not everyone who is migrating are having similar kind of experience in the, uh, in, 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 at the destinations. Now, if we look at the, 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 the background of this migration, the background factors in this migration. I think three conceptual frames or three ideas about the Indian economy need to be taken into account to understand the context. The first one is on even development. Post reform economic growth has been highly unequal in terms of inter regional disparities and interpersonal disparities. So, increasing inter regional disparities in terms of level of development and the trajectories of development has meant that uh, from the relatively less developed areas, labor has started to move out to relatively uh, more prosperous areas. There are macro linkages in terms of labor flows across uh, the states and regions, particularly uh, there are talks of an internal demographic dividend where uh, my labor from the relatively more populous but less developed states have started to move out to uh, in such of employment in the relatively, you know, uh, uh, more developed or at least growing uh, states in Western uh, and, and Southern India in particular. However, an interstate understanding of this process may not be adequate because in every state we find there are uh, regions which are, which are more backward than others. And often the, 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 the distinction between uh, um, migrant sending states and receiving states gets blurred as it was pointed out, uh, pointed out by uh, Professor Bomik in the context of Northeast India. Uh, that the same states or same regions could be sending uh, migrants as well as receiving migrants. So interstate uh, disparities may not be in fact, a may not give us a complete understanding of this uneven development, which is at the root of this out migration processes. The second point is about the prolonged agrarian crisis and rural distress. Now, the, the, it is of course for partly at least uh, policy in, uh, in, uh, induced, many would argue largely policy induced change in uh, in, 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 in the sphere of agriculture and in the rising cost of uh, uh, inputs in agriculture and, and the, the fluctuating and unreliable prices in the output market uh, are, are, the, are, are the reasons behind uh, the, a prolonged period of crisis. But let me point out that uh, the agrarian crisis is often described in terms of indicators like uh, the, the suicide of farmers. Suicides are uh, in fact a, an extreme manifestation of the crisis, but the absence of suicides doesn't mean that there is an absence of crisis. Now, similarly, there are uh, at times the, uh, the agrarian crisis is described in terms of uh, the fluctuating uh, productivity growth in agriculture. I think a better way to capture the distress dimension is to look at uh, the, the inability of a large sections of the peasantry and agricultural labor force solely on the basis of agriculture. So there are, there are various, you know, evidences to point out that apart from a very tiny sections of very large farmers, the incomes from agriculture are not simply enough for the survival and reproduction of households in, 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 in agriculture. So a natural uh, outcome of that is a kind of uh, diversification of uh, livelihoods. And one form of diversification is, is, is through the spatial reallocation of livelihoods. However, this spatial reallocation of livelihood could be accumulative or distress driven. For some, this could be a means to invest their agrarian surplus through non-agrarian channels, particularly in the, in the, in the education of their children, in, 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 in urban uh, housing, in, 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 uh, in real estate or transport and communications, trading, so on and so forth. But for many, this spatial reallocation of livelihoods is a move desperately to look for other avenues for survival outside agriculture. Two processes, I will not go into the details of it, but two processes which form the foundation of this moving out are disposition. Disposition of owners of means of production from the ownership of these means of production. So, so uh, not only in terms of large scale land acquisition, but also through various processes which undermine the foundations of livelihoods in a rural setting, including environmental degradation, uh, extreme climatic events, uh, degradation of CPRs, so on and so forth, are behind the process of disposition, which uh, takes away the sources of livelihood of uh, 
predominantly rural population from their control. The other process is the normal working of the economy, a capitalist economy in which uh, the peasantry gets differentiated and has part of uh, the, 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 the uh, people who lose, uh, who are pushed out of uh, their livelihoods join the uh, urban labor force. But when they go out, they go move into the informal economy. Now, informal economy is an economy where workers survive without decent social security. They, they, they are engaged in insecure, precarious employment. They are uh, mostly uh, dependent. They are, they, they are so precarious that, in fact, in fact, the COVID-19 crisis told us in, in very clear terms that they are not able to survive uh, for even two, three weeks without in, in the face of a sudden uh, decrease in their employment and earnings. So that means multiple sectors uh, and, and multiple kinds of livelihoods, including a mix of self-employment and wage level. Institutions of caste, gender, ethnicity, and religion and language further divide this workforce in the informal economy. Before I move up, move to other points quickly, informal economy is typically understood as a residual sector, a sector which is not within the regulative power of the state, but I would argue that it is beyond this understanding, we must go and see it as a specific kind of production relation that generates vulnerability. I will return to this point uh, if, if possible later. Apart from this understanding of migration, there is also an understanding of migration where, which is a positive understanding of migration. As uh, Professor Sam, I think, remarked that migration is part of the development process and rightly so. But increasingly, uh, and, and this is particularly before the crisis, migration is seen as, a, a, as an outcome of voluntary choice of individuals and households in response to opportunities rather than distress. It is pointed out that much of this migration is actually aspirational in nature, both in terms of economic and non-economic drivers of migration. It is also important to recognize that when people migrate out from a region, they send back remittances. So there is always uh, in, in response to the uh, along with the, the outflow of labor, there is a reverse flow of money, information, and technology. And this could be a basis for further development of the backward regions. And in this understanding, this is a win-win situation, even if the migrants are not permanently staying in the urban areas, they are circulatory. Because in the urban areas, there is the availability of cheap labor. And as in the case of China, the migrant workers are not staying in the urban areas, then they are not crowding in the urban infrastructure. So both origin and destination areas you know, uh, can develop as a result of this. In, a, in another way, this is a market mediated spatial trickle down effect that is that can actually take care of poverty. And, and, and many commentators were hopeful that this kind of a migration will in the final analysis, uh, you know, uh, help uh, both the destination and the origin areas. There are many things which are found to be uh, described in this, in, in, in this context uh, or that are found to be true on the ground. However, a generalized description of this nature typically fails to take account of the huge diversity in migration outcomes that we also see. So the point is not to, to, to move away actually from a generalized description of migration uh, and, and migrant workers to understand the specificities of this way of, of the ways through which specific groups of migrants, specific classes of migrants get integrated, incorporated into uh, the, 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 the larger market. So if all migrants are not really uh, vulnerable, who are the vulnerable migrants? Vulnerable migrants are those who are in the informal economy, self-employed and wage labor without any social security. Vulnerable migrants also include those migrants who work in the formal economy as informal workers. All of us know that there is a process of informalization and casualization of formal sector over the past many years. So even if you are working in the in the formal sector, there is no guarantee that you have a, a secured a, a, a secure job or a social security. Along with that, the seasonality and circularity of circularity of migration flows that also creates a, a, the specificity of, of of vulnerability. In what sense? The migrants who are migrating out seasonally, they typically migrate out uh, in, 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 uh, you know, uh, in, in response to the changing labor demand uh, in the origin as well as in the destination areas over seasons. So these, the, the migration cycles are linked to, uh, typically linked to, linked to agricultural cycles. Circulatory migrants, on the, on the other hand, they migrate constantly they are through back and forth movements between origin and destination areas. And that, that, that may or may not coincide with the 
seasonality of agricultural cycles but what is important is that they are neither a comf uh, you know comfortably settled in the uh, in the in the in the origin nor are they uh, completely detached from the, the the destinations so so they they try to balance between these two and this is one reason why we found so many migrants migrant workers uh, in the face of the crisis decided to go back uh, leading to an increase in unemployment in, in agriculture at the at the bottom of the job hierarchy are of course bonded laborers who take an advance and work off their loans we'll talk about them a little uh, later if time permits if we look at vulnerability we need to look at vulnerability in these three different dimensions because uh, it a, a, a good policy has to respond not only to 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 the eradication of vulnerability or at least minimization of vulnerability but also look at different kind of vulnerabilities and their interrelationships at the origin areas at the source areas people move out but everyone doesn't end up as as a vulnerable migrant so what exactly are the are the are the are the are the determining factor which pushes some into the hyper insecurity hyper precarity that we witness in in the in the urban job market who migrates and how is the, the 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 crucial question and in my mind addressing the lack of choices lack of viable alternative in the origin areas is one of the ways through which we can address the question of long term vulnerability so my, the vulnerability vulnerability might be manifested in some in in some other sphere but its origin might be linked to the source and origin areas secondly vulnerability in the process of migration field studies Uh, demonstrate that when migrant workers okay. move out typically those who are less educated with less uh, you know uh, social and, and 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 economic capital capital they try to move out through these two channels either through the layers of contractors they might be employed finally in a in a globally integrated uh, technologically sophisticated uh, multinational corporation or a big corporate house but but they are they are employed through A, a hierarchy of a layers of contractors and subcontractors and their agents so that entry point determines the trajectory of their outcome to some extent the other alternative increasingly in the case of youth uh, out migration is through social networks family friends relative here again if we understand social capital as in terms of, through the lens of social relations we will find that social capital is not a universal idea it is a for, for, for the migrant workers social capital is a fragmented social capital there might be and it, 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 the flow of information about jobs where it is available the terms of uh, joining the the, the, the the occupations so on and so forth are conditioned by their access to the right kind of social networks which is conditioned by their socio economic positions finally vulnerability at the destinations informality and precarity about which we have already uh, discussed a little that creates the conditions under which people work in the informal economy for many of the workers this has meant that they are typically invisible they are typically invisible from the urban economy from the destination economy in what sense at the origin and 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 let me you know uh, flag this issue that although economic outcomes are easier to capture in some somewhat easier to capture behind the vulnerability lies the process of you know political marginalization social marginalization because access to jobs employment social security depends on certain preconditions and these preconditions are mediated through institutions both formal and informal and getting integrated with that requires some kind of political voice at least in in, the, in terms of changing the conditions requires some kind of political voice but because of at least for a section of migrant workers those who are most vulnerable it is found that when they migrate out they they typically do not gain the same citizenship right at the destinations and in the origin in fact the the in the case of uh, seasonal and circular migrants at the origin they become you know um, unreliable voters unreliable supporters because they might not be there when their support is needed by the leaders so there is a weakening of their 
voice, if at all there was some voice in the origin areas. And at the destination areas, they are often treated as unwanted outsiders or simply forgotten or invisible workers. So this workforce, which constantly plays a very significant role in providing various kinds of services to the urban economy. In fact, the economy as a whole suffers as it has happened when migrant workers went back. Initially, there was lockdown, but in the post lockdown phase also, it took the economy to revive precisely because there was labor shortages in, in various parts of the country. So that should convince us about the role that is played by migrant workers at the destination areas. However, their roles are not only minimized, the way it is not only about employment and earnings, the way cities and, and, and urban areas are being reconfigured through a framework of uh, neoliberal reconstruction of space in urban areas, we find that typically the right to passage, the right to the city itself is, is, is denied to a section of migrant workers. And those migrant workers who live in the work sites, uh, live in, in, in distant uh, fields, uh, in, 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 in construction sites away from the city, they typically they are, they are in fact, their citizenship right gets fractured. They are not considered as citizens. Whenever they are considered as citizens, they are considered through a, the prism of exception rather than rule. Now coming to the question of a migration policy. Before we go further, let me share, share an experience. Before this, before this pandemic, I've been working on a, on, on a group of migrant, seasonal migrant workers in one of the least developed parts of Odisha. And there were constant efforts by various NGOs and state authorities to register the migrants. And migrants refused to be, you know, register, routinely refused to, uh, to register themselves. In fact, many of them tried, tried to, you know, flee uh, without registering themselves in the night or, or in, through various clandestine means. Before we move or talk, move into a migration policy or even talk about a migration policy, we should be clear about one thing that it is not if the policy of my, uh, of, the, of the objective of migration policy is about regulating or controlling migrant flow, migration flows. I don't think that is going to work. That will lead to various kind of uh, you know, abnormalities, unintended consequences, so on and so forth. The other dimension is the questions about the right to privacy of individuals. Most of the migration uh, policies supporting migrant workers, for example, increasingly rely on digital platforms where migrants have to, you know, control, uh, have to enroll themselves. Now that means the state will have information about the existence of the, the concentration of migrant workers, so on and so forth. Now, the state, however, is an heterogeneous institution. To the extent that it can be captured by various kinds of uh, you know, elements who might not be friendly to the migrants, and state policy is not necessarily always uh, you know, uh, friendly to migrants. Uh, we notice that in some cases, state governments try to stop the trends from stopping the migrants from moving out. One must have sufficient checks and balances so that this information doesn't violate the rights of migrant workers. I will flag this issue because I think the right policy is not to control, regulate, and somehow you know, channelize migration in, pre in, in predetermined directions. Rather, the right approach should be an enabling policy addressing vulnerability of migrant workers. Those migrant workers who are skilled, who, have, who are moving out uh, with, 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 uh, with uh, sufficient uh, information, background information about the prospects and are joining a relatively high paid job, they probably do not need the state to support them to that extent. But vulnerable migrant workers do need a form of state support. So what I'm trying to say is that the objective should be very clear, but then, Questions are raised as to what about our past experiences? The interested migrant workers, I mean, studies uniformly show that it was almost never employed, uh, never implemented properly. So given that, we need to also pause and think whether what we are proposing as new solutions, whether the state has the capacity to implement those 
those those uh, those those policies and programs which are supposed to help uh, migrant workers. So to sum up three important caveats before we move on to migrant policies, migration migration policies, uh, migration policies should be to uh, to to address the vulnerability of migrant workers rather than to control migration flows. The data that is, con the, we do not have a data, but the data that is to be collected needs, there should be sufficient checks and balances within the system to prevent the misuse of that information. And also uh, the, the implementation part of the policy is at least as important as the intention to help migrant workers. Some broad questions, some broad, uh, you know, uh, foundations of migration policy. The first, uh, the first bottleneck is to move beyond the neoliberal orthodoxy about state interventionism. Neoliberalism broadly argues that market-based solutions are better than uh, any kind of you know, state intervention because state intervention in, 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 invariably leads to inefficiencies of various kinds. And hence, they are deeply suspicious of state intervention, uh, including interventions in favor of labor. One needs to go beyond that to, uh, to, to, to see why there are cases where uh, the market may not provide a decent livelihood to, to a section of migrant workers, and hence the uh, state must step in. Uh, and, and that is one of the foundation, that can be one of the foundations of an alternative policy, is that the requirement, the, the necessity of state intervention in certain situations must be accepted as a legitimate objective of, you know, a legitimate dimension of policy. Second thing is we cannot secure or address the vulnerability of migrant workers without having a general framework of rights of citizens and or rights of uh, individuals. As I was saying that vulnerability also gets reproduced because of the low bargaining power, low voices of migrants in the institutional uh, structures of democracy. A rights-based approach is different from uh, a, 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 from from other kinds of approach here because here the rationality of, of the, the the rationale of state intervention is derived from a commitment to provide a decent, dignified life to individuals. So there are of course this, this by saying this I mean when we say this normally the 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 question that is that is thrown back to us is that then where is the capacity of the state to do so? State capacity is, 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 is something which evolves over time. If the right kind of uh, commitment is there and it is backed up by, by action, I think right-based approach provides, provides a wider net, a, a better approach to include the, or, or to address vulnerabilities. In many cases, migrant workers suffer because they are treated differently. So one of the basic principles, basic foundations of policy should be, should be to eliminate discrimination between migrants and non-migrants in every sphere. This is not easy because uh, the, 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 the institutions through which one can do that is, is, uh, is, are likely to be less sympathetic to non-migrants for the reasons I've already discussed. But then this is, this is, uh, this is one of the cornerstone of an enabling inclusive migrant pol migration policy. The economic rights of the citizens, which I talked about a little while ago, needs to be recognized as part of their citizenship rights. Citizenship doesn't mean just voting once in, in, in five years. Citizenship means a bundle of uh, you know, freedoms, a bundle of uh, capability enhancing uh, support from the state. And those rights should be, should be the foundation on which you can create a migration policy. Workers' rights are not a popular issue these days. It is, it is thought generally that if states support uh, you know, uh, workers' uh, demand for minimum wages or work contracts, then it will weaken uh, the, 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 the growth of uh, a growth prospects of a capitalist economy. Uh, but then uh, one, I, I think the investment in, in workers' capabilities, in, in enhancing the conditions of working condition and living conditions of worker is in fact an investment in the future of the economy. That is when you are providing support to the workers, it doesn't, migrant workers in this case, vulnerable workers in this case, it is not that 
you are just spending money in in a kind of wast wasteful uh, populist uh, you know adventure what it means is that if it is being done in the right way then we are creating the foundations of a more sustainable and more equitable uh, economy there are, there are lots of instrumentalist arguments in the sense that why a skilled educated uh, healthy workforce is better uh, for the growth process but i think in the final analysis it should be recognized as an as an end in itself living a productive and dignified life should be recognized as an end in itself as a, in terms of its intrinsic value and that is derived from uh, the, the idea of citizenship rights that should be the foundation not the short term economic gains of providing the uh, the the, uh, the the support to workers although there will be many different kinds of support uh, gains from the support again one has to choose between both immediate concerns short term in interventions and long term interventions so i'll speak more about long term inter interventions primarily because these are less popular behind the vulnerability is actually the lack of choice the workers who who move into precarious jobs insecure jobs it's not that they do not understand the risk of joining such jobs they they go for such some of the worst forms of uh, employment contracts primarily because of lack of alternatives lack of alternative sources of livelihood physical financial human capital so there are two ways of addressing this question one is through asset redistribution this is normally not very popular in policy circles these days because the moment you talk about uh, land reforms or or any kind of asset redistribution normally it is cost it, it it is it is you know categorized as politically not feasible and or impractical but then let us understand that access to land can be achieved through a number of different means i will not go into the details there are arguments that there is no surplus land available but yet we know that Uh, the, the, there are land land uh, lease market is a dynamic market there are categories of land owners who are not necessarily interested in land there can be mechanisms to address that but only not only about land it's also about halting uh, for example uh, privatization of cprs other forms of uh, privatization of, of water bodies that might help might help in in having alternative sources of livelihoods the long term way forward of course is to invest in health education and skills there is no you know alternative to that because in future there may not be jobs uh, which are which are uh, you know that there may not be enough good jobs which uh, which one can access without necessary education and skills a migration policy apart from other things has to has to address two basic you know uh, tasks one is through supporting livelihood supporting livelihoods through creating gainful employment either directly through state intervention as in the case of the mgnreg or indirectly through supporting labor intensive uh, or or uh, 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 manufacturing and services apart from that social security for workers and their families this idea is is gradually gaining ground that that universally the universal social security for workers may be needed uh, to improve the working and living conditions of workers as one kind of solution so i would say both these uh, channels of interventions are equally important let's talk about the interventions at the origin because the moment we talk about migrant workers typically one thinks of the thing that can be done at the destination evidence shows that gradual and systematic improvements in agrarian life livelihoods say our prosperity in agriculture it's not just that average incomes are increasing in agriculture uh, agriculture is getting commercialized one needs to see whether the benefits of this increase uh, income if at all it is there is it coming to the 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 a larger section of peasantry or is it being concentrated in in, in the top bracket a shared prosperity in agriculture particularly the provision of irrigation studies find that they do reduce the extent of distress migration rural non farm employment the first choice of many migrant workers is the is is non farm employment in the in the vicinity expansion of that employment guarantee not just announcement of a program but its fruit, its faithful implementation 
wages should be uh, decent wages should be more than the minimum statutory wages not less than that dependable employment and the employment for a duration which is which is considered uh, you know uh, 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 substantial from the perspective of the workers and finally easy and timely payments of the wages all these factors depend on how effective the the employment guarantee scheme can be on the ground if we are thinking about uh, reducing uh, vulnerability at the origin in the origin areas but it has to be coupled with employment guarantee in the urban areas particularly in the small and medium towns particularly because of uh, the uh, relay uh, migration uh, that that one witnesses from small and medium towns to other places credit support if you if you look at the reasons behind uh, taking loans against uh, one's future labor power one of the fundamental reasons for taking that credit from the informal market could be uh, the the uh, unanticipated uh, decline in income as a result of let us say crop failure often it is also because of catastrophic health expenditure most of the migrant workers who join dadan for example they they utilize this money uh, to to either to support their you know immediate consumption or to to pay for their immediate consumption expenditure or to 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 pay for the loans that they have taken for catastrophic uh, health expenditure and in the crop failures on and so forth finally rural infrastructure development including social infrastructure we have already talked about education and health because the 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 intergenerational transfer of vulnerability works through the collapse of you know uh, public health and and public uh, education in the rural areas the, its 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 impacts are not visible but over a period of time when we see uh, a large number of young uh, dropouts or uh, who who migrate uh, and and join you know um, the labor force it is primarily because of these kind of forces these kind of conditions can the state play a role in creating employment other than this employment guarantee because that can be only for few days can there be a prospect for growth of uh, labor intensive manufacturing and service activities i think it, it one can if if one dares to imagine a, an alternative growth path that is more dispersed that is more regionally balanced and that is more uh, you know embedded in local value chains local demand and and and, and local raw materials it is possible to create Uh, a, a dispersed set of uh, manufacturing and 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 service activities and let us remember that that was one of the strategies through which the 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 the, the solid foundations for manufacturing in china was established what can be done at the destination in terms of we'll talk about social security later but in terms of employment generation again growth of labor intensive economic activities focusing on msme growth there is already some focus on that there are already some talk talk some talk on that but in, in when we combine all these we need to be very careful about what is happening uh, on at, at the micro on the, in terms of the uh, conditions of work in the micro enterprises uh, where own account uh, workers and unpaid domestic workers are, are are concentrated as i have already said there is a scope for the urban employment guarantee as well and yes it's not a matter of employment guarantee alone livelihoods depend on access to transport housing credit and law enforcement so all these policies are are to be combined with employment generation for say by the state or directly or or, or employment generation through other means uh, to 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 provide you know uh, the 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 necessary uh, uh, employment to at least a section of the migrant workforce let me just clarify one point when we were talking about the way state should provide employment in the origin areas or the state should provide uh, employment in the in the destination area the idea is not that state has to provide employment to each and every person but the point is this if state provides some employment opportunities if state provides access to some livelihood opportunities then it increases the bargaining power of the workers who are likely to enter into the most exploitative forms of labor contracts so the the objective here should be very clear for example we need 
uh, investment in the rural areas not necessarily to stop everyone from leaving the village but to ensure that people are, when they are moving out they are not moving out in search of food and and it might be you know might sound surprise uh, surprising for some but as a researcher in some of the worst affected areas uh, people do migrate out even today uh, because they do not have enough opportunities to survive in the in the in the origin area so they move out so at least the 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 the, the creation of these kind of alternative employment opportunities alternative livelihood assets will i believe will help in reducing some of the worst forms of out migration it does it is it should not be seen as policies to restrict migration the processes through which vulnerable uh, vulnerability gets uh, you know re uh, emphasized or, or reproduced are linked to the way the informal economy works it is called unorganized sector but it is not disorganized it works through various social institutions and the concentration of socially disadvantaged groups in some of the worst labor contracts say uh, tell us that it is it is not the accidental not that just it is not just an accident that those who are socially marginalized uh, belonging to sidhu uh, caste uh, sidhu tribe uh, communities minorities they they are uh, they end up with the worst employment uh, uh, outcomes in the migration labor market so there is it is it is linked to the way migration labor flows are segregated through the use of social institutions if we take the case of debt bondage and on free labor there is a reason to address these very concerns in a, in a, in, a, in a straight forward manner in terms of defining and monitoring on freedom and and making it a, 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 making the labor contractors final employers and state institutions you know uh, uh, accountable for any kind of bondage that is found in labor contracts so this is there there might be a need for addressing the sectoral concentration of on free labor and integration of rehabilitation program of for bonded laborers quickly in terms of social security i think i'm running out of time so quickly in terms of social security there should be universal social security why should there be universal social security because the way employment is 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 diversified in the informal economy the way migrant labor is are are, are constantly moving between jobs and locations uh, between wage employment and self employment if we try to go for a sector specific or targeted approach to secure social security there will be lots of exclusion and inclusion errors the transaction cost of getting one self enrolled again and again or proving one's and uh, one's credentials for entitlement might lead to high transaction costs so one should rather move from a universal floor level so, uh, social security to seri to to sectoral and occupation specific social security because workers in some sectors might be needing additional kind of uh, you know support so what would be the universal social security components all these food security affordable uh, and quality health care sanitation education for children housing rights minimum wages these are well defined in the ilo uh, conventions and ilo uh, uh, deliberations i think it should be towards uh, you know Uh, some kind of decent jobs in the informal economy as well but here are some of the uh, you know uh, key points key key uh, ways of 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 uh, designing a policy it should be inclusive identification itself is is might lead to exclusion of some workers the way we we the way they, there is a digital divide in our society and we expect workers to register themselves in digital platforms uh, particularly given the digital divide and gender divide uh, that we have in the society the process of providing this service itself might create uh, exclusions of various kind and it is not a question of percentage 10% we have achieved 90% of the workers for example are registered that doesn't the, the point is those 10% are probably the most uh, in in most need of, uh, of 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 support state support there there is the question of accessibility in terms of location language institutions covid 19 has taught us even as and even before that many state governments have welfare schemes particularly let us say uh, through construction workers for construction workers but the way it is structured migrant workers who do not uh, who cannot approach or cannot go there uh, to the offices 
the institutions are such that they do not you know uh, do, do not accept them as legitimate claimants language can be a barrier so accessibility question has to be addressed in the design of the programs affordability small financial costs private costs of availing benefits going to the offices doing the rounds proving their credentials these might be substantial for migrant workers which might lead to their exclusion portability is often highlighted of course if we if we do not de delink the entitlements from the domicile status uh, i think it is not going to be helpful for migrant workers within or beyond the states divisibility some migrant workers leave their families behind so if they are accessing the the let us say pds at the origin a part of it should be accessible uh, in the in the destination as well in terms of what kind of i will not go into the details of it but what kind of institutional mechanism will be needed for this kind of a program there is no alternative to but but, but, but to, to to a decentralized democratic and cooperative federalism because we have seen during covid 19 cri crisis that capacity at the local level at the state level panchayat and urban local bodies level is crucial to design effective policy implementation however it's not easy because the the it it will require not only a, a, a sharing of uh, burden among states so we need a democratic institutions horizontal uh, coordination among center and the state but also among the states particularly bilateral coordination uh, mechanism between uh, the states uh, which will be needed to take care of uh, the the, the to, to provide entitlements uh, without uh, any 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 problem to the migrant workers of course we need more uh, data on that i will not dwell on this point finally i will i'm not uh, you know, uh, I don't study this part, but normally a question is asked, uh, where will the money come from? How will you pay for it? There are enough studies available, including a, a report by ILO, uh, Social Protection uh, Floor for India, and then uh, the, the calculations of the uh, National Commission for Unorganized Sector Workers. I think and there, there is the, this fiscal space is there if there is political will. Uh, various options can be and combinations of options can be tried tax, taxation of, of uh, particularly targeting wealth inequality expenditure re reallocation sharing of burden across states convergence of programs take for example the 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 construction and building workers says the, the 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 there is a law by which construction uh, certain amount of says is collected and we see highly uneven way of uh, you know spending that money in many states that money remains Unspent. So probably the binding constant is not fiscal uh, in, in terms of uh, availability of enough money for expenditure. Rather, it is a question of political prioritization. I I will just stop by highlighting a few. Uh, I know I'm exceeding my time, but I'll just uh, highlight some of the theoretical implications of what I have said. The first thing is, and and before I conclude, that the first thing is that please feel free. Don't stop, Nick, sir. Okay, At least you can you. take. No okay, problem. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bhomik. Uh, uh, the first thing is that our understanding of a Lewisian process of transformation has led to some kind of a sectoral approach to labor. I think the, 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 the continuing significance of the agrarian origins of informal labor is an underemphasized and underappreciated aspect of migration vulnerabilities. The relationship between the rural areas and the urban areas are complex. One of our studies, for example, shows that migrant workers move out in based in West Bengal. My, migrant workers move out at a very young age. They work in construction sector uh, first for, for during much for during uh, much of their youth, but after some time they return back. And when they return back, the skills that they have learned, whatever skills they have learned, become, com becomes, become completely redundant in the rural context. And their, their health has deteriorated to such an extent, they find it very difficult to even work in, 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 uh, in, in, in demanding jobs in the rural context as well. So this leads to a process of out-migration, which might be beneficial if we look at a, in a, in a uh, uh, in, in, a, in a specific time frame, but we take a lifetime of the migrant workers. We find that the the the, the advantages of slightly higher income uh, and remittances, which was there 
in the early phases of migration soon uh, you know dies out in some cases not in all cases at least the another aspect normally it is being it is it is expected that those who are moving out of agriculture gradually will it will lead to a weakening of ties between agriculture and and the out migrants maybe that is happening we'll see over a period of time but as of now petty commodity production that is producing for the market but without accumulation which is the dominant form for uh, form of uh, production in agricultural farms we find that gets that relationship of of this uh, petty commodity production in agriculture and out migration is complex sometimes out migration is actually giving a new lease of life through remittances to petty commodity production in agriculture for which small farms are able to survive we have seen another instance this year for example the foundation for agri uh, agrarian studies uh, they have done a village survey which finds and this is also corroborated by other secondary sources that acreage has expanded in agriculture there are more people employed in agriculture today primarily because they could not go back uh, some of those who had returned they could not go back they had nowhere to go and they are they are so so agriculture is 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 has emerged as a kind of shock absorber in the context of the crisis so the first point is that theoretically we need to understand more about the linkages between agri agriculture and informal economy so that we understand how vulnerability in one sphere translates into a vulnerability in other sphere second point informality is not easily going away not because it is desirable i don't think those kind of livelihoods uh, should be there but the point is the way indian economy is getting integrated into into the global capitalist economy that provides again a new lease of life to the informality the the theoretical anticipation that as you become a more advanced economy in terms of per capita income your production structure will be more formalized and the labor market accordingly will change is at least not seen in in the in the in the in the in the last couple of decades we do find that there are some aspects of you know uh, formal employment increasing but largely we see that 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 this informal sector is getting intertwined with the global political economy uh, global capitalist economy in a way in which this reserve army of labor of migrant workers vulnerable migrant workers acts as as cheap labor providing surplus value we looked at the way migrant workers send their remittances in one of the surveys and the only conclusion that can be drawn given the percentage of money that they send back is that they are living a very in 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 a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way where they are trying to survive with the with, the, with minimum uh, costs at the urban areas they are sharing accommodation they are sharing uh, food they are trying to survive with minimum expenditure in urban areas so that families uh, uh, in, back in their villages can survive the way women are contributing to this migrant migration uh, process as vulnerable workers as in fact in fact workers who are discriminated against because they are not rarely paid equal wages for the same work as as family members of migrant workers living in slums and other uh, in, in in other uh, urban areas and as 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 uh, uh, staying back uh, for, as part of staying back back families what are they doing what they are doing is they are trying to reduce the cost of reproduction of labor for capital so this vulnerable migrant migrant labor force is in essence trying to uh, trying to exploit themselves at times so that cheap labor can be there one might argue that but most of the cheap labor uh, most of the globally integrated farms are are, are based on it um, uh uh enable sectors for the, that's about more skilled workers uh, but but the, the skilled workers are also cheap in relation to their counterparts in the developed countries and one of the reasons why they are cheap is also because of the services cheap services provided by uh, the uh, the migrant workforce so my last point is that this is one kind of inter integration to global capitalism where cheap labor becomes a a, a, a cornerstone of our uh, of our successful integration but then we are we are we are the, the price of this integration is being paid by a section a, a section of labor force uh, literally 
uh, you know they are they are they are being they are they are they are uh, they are, they, are, they are contributing to the cheapening of labor cost uh, at at great cost to themselves there could be an alternative way of integration if you can't imagine anything else then an alternative way of in, in, uh, integration could be decentralized development based on uh, you know innovation skills and 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 investment in the capacity of labor i'll stop here and i will wait for your comments and criticisms thank you thank you professor mishra I, i believe everybody will agree with me that it was wonderful experience listening from professor mishra with his rich experience of working in this field as well as in other domains he has woven uh, very intricately the various facets of migration thank you sir uh, if i can uh, open up the chat for everybody but before doing i would just like to refresh the memories of everyone uh, professor mr started uh, i beg your pardon my connectivity is very poor here i started um, no in a brilliant way by explaining the context of migration uh, in of out migration particularly for uh, the people from the rural area to the urban areas where they mostly add up to the informal economy and uh, th their access to the informal economy is the main reason why they emerge as vulnerables if i have um, rightly put it now obviously employment in the empl uh, informal economy is without social security and that is the major reason for the distress that we had witnessed during the covid pandemic particularly last year now it is it is in this backdrop that he comes out with various points about the why vulnerability is persistent at the origin at the destination and obviously he weaves towards a possible migration policy where he considers that yes uh, there are opportunities for state to intervene particularly uh, regarding uh, certain uh, uh, bringing in certain policy issues so that the vulnerable vulnerability of the migrant workers can be addressed and uh, he expects that our experiences from the past can be used for developing the current scenario obviously uh he strongly believes that migration policy should be oriented towards reducing the vulnerability of the migrants at the, uh, at the origin but uh, the state intervention can be of various ways and um uh, he would like to focus more on long term uh intervention so that we can have a long term gain and uh, he believes that access to livelihood assets uh, particularly through asset redistribution would be a great help particularly uh, for the migrants because that would be an address, uh, that would uh, also address the livelihood vulnerability at the origin of the migrants who are really uh, in most cases move out because of lack of alternatives now obviously in this backdrop what emerges at many a times is uh, this issue of migration in uh, encompasses uh, seasonal and cyclical variation and here also issues of intergenerational uh, migration comes up and what he has rightly observed which i strongly uh, believe and support uh, is uh, about his views is that many of the migrant workers when they move out from the rural agrarian sector to the urban informal sector the kind of jobs that they are uh, akin with they work upon the skill that they develop upon on their re return that is hardly useful so this is an area where when we think about uh, migration policy we have to focus upon and um, well the major uh, issue which uh, requires uh, addressing is universal social security and basically it's uh, the focus should be more for vulnerable uh, migrants and uh, it is in this backdrop that uh, i would like to open up the floor we have a few questions which i believe um, Uh, Mr. Sir, can you just have a look yeah. into the chats? Yeah, I, I, I can see them. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I would like uh, you to take up the theoretical issues first, and then if we can come down to the specifics, because the uh, queries from uh, Professor Boru, uh, Professor Jadip Borua, uh, Mr. Pranjit Bora, 
these are more related to the neoliberal conditions. If you if I if you can read it out, then no, no point yeah. in me repeating the questions. Okay. If you can take up uh, these two at one go, and then we move on to other queries. That is what I would right. like you to do. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Professor Indra. Uh, now, uh, I mean, I'll, let me uh, address this uh, the the question that is common to two of these questions. One is. Uh, can the can we i mean since since it's a neoliberal state uh, can we really think of any alternative uh, uh, will it be it's, it's it's difficult because the the dominance of neolib neoliberalism uh, it came about in various ways but i am you know being an academician and an, and an economist uh, of some kind so my interest is is is, is to see how exactly the ideology of neoliberalism was masked behind a series of theoretical propositions which were presented as neutral even you know uh, uh, unquestionable conclusions of a sophisticated economic analysis the uh, so 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 neo neoliberalism is not only about a set of academic ideas of course it is about a kind of uh, you know ideological tool to make certain kinds of uh, policies more acceptable to the society than others but at the same time it is possible to constantly question neoliberalism through research action and, and, and other political means so that an alternative consensus can be generated i'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that you know it, it is going to be easy but at the same time, let us look at the diversity. Let's look at the diversity within major capitalist countries. And we find numerous instances of state intervention in favor of labor in diverse forms existing in today's you know, uh, capitalist economies. There are lessons to be learned, for example. the the, the um, uh, uh, public investment in health in the context of uh, COVID-19, the rethinking about state's role in the economy in the context of the 2008 crisis, the uh, varieties of capitalist state that we see, particularly in the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries. These, are, these point to the possibility of creating or at least suggesting alternatives if we look at the the response of kerala in the during the pandemic we find that long term investment in 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 labor rights in 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 labor in in education and health of the population and strong state presence at the grassroots can make a difference so i'm saying that it's 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 difficult obviously but it's not completely hopeless because even neoliberalism in a democracy has to confront the 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 the, uh, the popular opinion uh, in 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 the society. So to the extent that we can bring in, in fact, uh, we can highlight the gains from a, an interventionist strategies in some context at least. It is possible to overcome that deficit. That's the first, you know, because that is about political uh, this thing. Now, uh, Professor Varua's question, Jadip's question is that uh, the rights of workers the the universal rights and if i have understood correctly this is the the link between universal rights and specific nature of incorporation of migrant workers into the labor market and the vulnerabilities the specific vulnerabilities that you know that are generated how do we reconcile these two points i think that is why i i i i think that it is better to start with a minimum but universal Floor of social security, which is accessible to each and every citizen without much many preconditions, so that workers, when we when they move between sectors or, or across locations, they are able to get some of these basic entitlements fulfilled. It will, however, not address specific vulnerabilities. Domestic live-in workers, for example, bonded laborers in, 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 in brick making industry, for example. There are sector-specific issues which cannot be addressed through such a general framework, but it can be built upon that general framework. 
once that right is provided on the basis of that again there can be specific rights nurses for example uh, women workers working in call centers for example all of them are they this the northeast migrant workers in delhi for example they all of them need support of very different kinds because of their specific vulnerabilities but then these specific vulnerabilities can be built uh, address, addressing these policies addressing these specific vulnerabilities can be built on the basis of a floor level concept if the floor level social security instead of being a minimum becomes a maximum then obviously these these layered uh, experiences of vulnerabilities cannot be addressed through this framework i am hoping that uh, but on the other hand if you go much into too much of sectoral approaches a, it it increases take for example these uh, the the uh, the the construction and other building work and other uh, building uh, building and other construction workers uh, um, welfare boards now migrant workers they come to the city let us say work for some days in the construction sector and then they move on to other sectors or maybe work maybe they, they, they try to find a livelihood as a self employed each time they do that they have to prove the that they the the their the, the that they have worked in the construction sector for so many days and in, they have to renew their uh, uh, membership and all these act as further tools of negotiation in the labor contract so to that extent sector specific uh, approaches in the absence of a universal social security might lead to problems but i am hopeful that it is possible to design specific or address specific vulnerabilities in the framework of a a a, a, a universal social security what do we do about you know the the gap between policy intent uh, and uh, the 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 uh, outcomes that has been highlighted as well now there is no other option than than learning uh, from our experiences and instead i mean that that is one that is the one of the classic neo, neoliberal arguments because state uh, intervention has failed in area a b and c it in general fails but then if then if 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 state has failed in crucial areas but that's not the logic which is applied while supporting capital if you take the state policies which are designed to attract investment for example there are numerous instances where they have worked and where they were they have not worked but then you keep on improvising uh, the 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 interventions and try to you know be be more attractive to capital in the similar way the answer to relative underperformance of specific policies is to press for better policies not abandonment of you know any concerns uh, of for, for state intervention of certain kind this is of course i what i'm what i'm you know saying is is will will require political will as as, as i uh, already mentioned but i think uh, the 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 gaps between uh, between between intended outcomes and uh, the real outcomes of policy can be uh, emphasized and, and the other thing is about convergence take for example that the the, the fact that the the urban local bodies or state intervention is required to provide certain basic infrastructure services for any kind of uh, industries including uh, the msmes to grow in a particular area increasingly there is a demand from citizens for provision of services from urban local bodies can these can these requirements be uh, combined with a commitment to provide employment so so there is there can be a convergence of of different objective objectives and that is another way to move forward investing in capacity building at the at the at the uh, panchayat level and ulb is, is again something which is you know ac uh, accepted across the board but what i'm saying that instead of just you know uh, relying on 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 the on the on the uh, routes to private for the privatization it is possible probably to to combine uh, various kind of service provisioning with employment generation uh, of some kind uh yes so there is also a third political there is also a question about i think tea garden laborers which which really is related to this as i said uh, although my own field work in 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 tea gardens is quite you know dated so i'm i'll be cause rather cause here what is happening but i'm not surprised to hear that that labor has returned back uh, to the gardens because that is one of the 
uh, you know that is that is one example which which will underscore the significance of investing in education and health in our study on 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 on, on, on the tigan labor market labor market we found that the 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 labor market is not confined to within the gardens is not only confined to first of all it is heavily casualized but then the the terms within which the labor is moving out provides a number of clues to to categorize it as a distressed diversification without much social capital uh, facing discrimination of various kinds uh, and and having very low levels of education which is not accidental which is a policy outcome of the way uh, you know uh, schools are located and school system works in the gardens results resulted in out migration of labor to again not to very uh, you know a very well paying jobs but mostly as as construction workers domestic servants so on and so forth so now that there is a crisis obviously there is no choice but to go back this will further depress wages and 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 there will be further competition for whatever employment is available one of the striking uh, results of our initial survey was that even when labor move out of tea gardens they return to tea garden during the plucking season so that means that they are moving out to places where they are not secure they do not have a, a secure job where they can even earn uh, as a, a, enough as a casual labor and they have to come back which is good because it keeps the for 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 those who are employing the the laborer because it keeps the wages down but it creates a cycle of vulnerability so like agriculture they are, they are, they are coming back to uh, the gardens primarily because if they are coming back then it is because of the lack of alternative choices the best way forward is to is to educate create capabilities at that end finally political question political vulnerability of migrant in a country like india let me you know emphasize a, another political point here if we see the experience of neoliberalism in various countries we find that initially it is proposed i mean it, it it was it was you know exported from the top i would say through various conditionalities of international financial institutions to 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 the ideas in academia dominant ideas in 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 in, in media it was it, 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 it was exported as top, but when it reached various countries, it took its own forms. It had to it had to interact with the specific nature of uh, the polity in the in the in the different countries. So what we have seen that neoliberalism on its own has not succeeded. It has succeeded in order to succeed. It has made alliances of various kinds. Welfare program sometimes selective populism at times. Uh, right wing chauvinism at times so neoliberalism requires or uses rather these kind of uh, you know opportunities to create alliances instead of so that doesn't mean that there will be no alternative mobilizes there cannot be any alternative to that the 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 at the same time there is greater awareness there is greater uh, mm. you know understanding uh, at at the popular level about the problems of discrimination about racism about gender discrimination so in that sense a, a, that is why i said non discrimination has to be one of the foundations on which you can you can build any any migration policies as long as migrants and host populations are treated differently by law in some cases they are or by institutional design or through political mobilization even in the you know in, in the states with best of the outcomes you see routine uh, you know uh discriminations against against migrant workers it is very difficult to eliminate vulnerabilities but then there is no other way but to strive to create a polity which is uh, you know more inclusive i think that is that's all i can say at the moment Ah, uh, thank you, Professor Mr. Uh, I am uh, not sure if you just like to have one more minute uh, in addressing uh, the specific query about from Pranob Shoykia. Uh, Particularly when he focuses about the aspect of uh, skilled migrant okay, workers yes, not getting yeah, enough yeah, opportunity. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, reminding me about this this question. Skilled migrants face various other crises, various other kinds of constraints as well. Skilled migrants. First of all, the process of skilled uh, migration of uh, migration of skilled labor, even when it is backed by state supported institutional mechanisms is not free from exploitation we if we see 
the out migration of uh, moderately skilled semi skilled uh, young women and men to various destinations uh, through i mean backed sometimes by ngo uh, support or state support of some kind we still find that at the destination uh, they are contractual workers they are not necessarily in the payrolls of their uh, there are studies which which show that they are not necessarily you know found in the payrolls of uh, Of, of of those who employ them moreover and 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 in the more extreme cases even their 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 housing and movement and other things are const, are are controlled by those who act either as intermediaries or as as employers at the destination so simply because as someone as is skilled doesn't mean that they are not part of this process of uh, vulnerable workforce but however there are sections of the skilled workforce who do not find you know employment uh, and 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 they, uh, they they quickly become uh, uh, redundant labor labor uh, their, their skills become quickly redundant or they themselves uh, in the absence of any opportunity immediate opportunity uh, uh, they, they 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 find themselves uh, at a at an extremely vulnerable position leading to various kinds of skill mismatches uh, one of our uh, phd scholars has in fact recently uh, uh, submitted a thesis on the extent of skill match mismatch in assam uh, in urban assam and there is it's it's huge the 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 in terms of uh, those who are uh, in in a job uh, in which for which they are, they are over qualified or they are in a job in which they are not using their skills that the the the, the percentages are are very high uh, even in 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 assam urban assam so we are expecting that it would be probably more in other states you need a very different approach for skilled migrants in terms of addressing institutional uh, you know bottlenecks but but a more uh, you know uh, critical point there is is in fact creation of jobs in the uh, professor ajit ghos has recently worked on what has happened in the in, in the recent uh, past on uh, in terms of job market and we see a clear division in terms of outcome uh, for for low skilled uh, semi skilled workers on the one hand and and those at the top end so so those vulnerabilities could have been addressed through as i said a dispersed growth of uh, activities enter enterprises uh, you know catering to 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 these uh, uh, to 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 the needs of the youth that is why youth unemployment rate uh, is is very high those who are uh, skilled and educated are not getting employment uh, they they are reflected in the at least they are manifested in the employment uh, uh, as as unemployed but there are also a category of workers particularly women who are simply discouraged workers they are not even seeking any job so these can be addressed through structural change policies i do not see any other uh, way to address this problem thank you thank you um, i believe uh, the participants you had your uh, responses to the queries that you had posed from uh, professor mishra uh, since uh, we do not have any other pending queries uh, i would uh, obviously i had the privilege of being part of this wonderful session it was one, uh, really enriching for me and uh, i thank the organizers for calling me in uh, one point i would just like to uh, bring forth here is that yes uh, professor mistra has uh, covered almost uh, everything uh it's even though he has made out a list uh, in one of his slide he said this is not exhaustive but it appears to be very exhaustive the way he has addressed uh obviously the vulnerability issue i think has one more dimension particularly in the recent times uh on the gender perspective and more specifically for the out migrants female out migrants young female out migrants from the northeastern region who are working in the hospitality and wellness sector i think they are also facing a lot of uh crisis and uh, that's an area which uh, i believe researchers from the region can also explore in future times and uh, so i fully agree uh, to what you have said uh, but very interestingly uh, one of the major sources of uh, data on migration is census that we generally have every 10 years and the 2021 census has been deferred it has been deferred and even the 2011 census data on migration came out very late uh but very interestingly what we observe is the data that we have on uh, census shows a lot of other dimensions uh 
uh, that it is not just work and employment which are the major causes of migration there are various other causes and i believe one of the major points uh, one of the reasons which uh, migration data sites is uh, moved with household which means about the dependent family members i think particularly in case of vulnerability for work related vulnerability that the major household head faces the family members are exposed to greater threats and they are part of a bigger a uh, number because only it's 9% around 9% uh, are uh, migrants for employment and work as per census data whereas uh, family members comprise for almost 15% so when we are talking about vulnerable policy uh, uh, migration policy for addressing the vulnerability issues i just the worker or the head of the household that should be the focus the focus should also be on the family members because they are also uh, facing the brunt that's all i would like to submit to the august audience uh, i would uh, professor borua uh, it was it's wonderful um, thing for from my side uh, i would like to hand over the baton to the team thank you Thank you for calling me. Okay, uh, um, Mirushmita, you can now uh, propose the vote of thanks formally. Uh, I would. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Mirushmita Dwara, Faculty of Social Work, on behalf of the Hujja Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences, would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Deepak Kumar Mishra. for your illuminating talk on the vulnerability of the migrants in the present context of the pandemic and uh, focusing also on the informal sector workers the necessary interventions the significance of migration policy upholding the rights based approach and social security of the migrants i thank professor indranil bhomik for your introductory and summative concluding remarks on the talk I extend my heartfelt thanks to our honorable vice chancellor professor N N Sharma sir director of SKBSS professor Joydeep Borua for your support the uh, professors colleagues and all the participants in here our team is also thankful to the IT cell for your technical support extended for the successful conduct of this program thank you all uh, borua sir if you have something to say you can go on No, it's okay. I mean, it was wonderful, Dipak. You know, nice to see you and also listen to you after a long time. And nice. I hope to hope to meet uh, personally and then uh, connect. Uh, and then also we will have some occasion to talk about more this thing. Thank and Indralinda also, thank you very much. You know, it was a pleasure. So thanks, thanks to everyone. Uh, so let let us conclude here, and then we will gather for the next talk, uh, 